will cover up only till Monday stuff, okay? So everything today won't be on the exam. Um, there's practice exams and solutions are posted. Um, Inez is having her exam review uh, 3 to 4.50 p.m. on Thursday, right? And what room is that in? Uh, 1.18.
So uh, that's the last thing we'll be uh, looking at for uh, some, uh, Friday's test, okay? So everything subsequent to that uh, will be on exam three. Okay, so uh, let's look at the combined gas law. So the combined gas law is very similar to Boyle, Charles, and uh, Gay-Lussac's law. It's actually just a squishing all of those laws together. Um, so you can see, hopefully, um, Boyle's law in it. Here, let's write this down. And I'll, maybe if I have enough colored chalk, I'll circle them all. Okay, so I'm going to erase. changes, volume changes, and temperature changes. So not just pressure and volume, or pressure and temperature, or pressure, or volume and temperature. Okay? So when you've got more than um, just the two variables changing, you're going to have to use the combined gas law. So uh, here's an example of using the combined gas law. It says uh, gas sample has a volume of 2.50 liters when it's at a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 1.80 atm. So let's write down all that stuff. So it says the volume, so that's going to be VI, equals 250 liters uh, when it has a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. And a pressure of 1 atm, or 1 point, sorry, 1.80 atm. So already you should, if you saw this, you should be like, okay, we're going to be using the combined gas law because we got these three variables. More than likely be using the combined gas law. We got to see if two of them are going to change, and then we'll definitely be. So let's see if we can find V at. Um, well, no, it looks like that's what we're looking for. So we don't know that one. Pf is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. <coughs> and then Tf is going to be 3.00 atm. Okay. So since you've got all of these variables, you know that you're going to be using the combined gas law. Okay? A lot of times it'll say, you know, the pressure is 1.80 atm and then it's constant or something like that. In those cases, you won't be using the combined gas law. They're just giving you a little extra information to kind of make it a little more confusing. Okay? But when two of them change and you've got all three of them, and you're looking for the change in the last one, you're always going to be using this combined gas law too. Okay? Um, so let's go ahead and manipulate this. So remember the combined gas law, TIVI, so that's Boyle's law over oops, TI 
Um, if you find, uh, what you'll find is if you do this calculation at standard temperature and pressure, volume per number of moles, you'll get this, uh, you'll get the volume always to be 22.4 liters. And so we consider that the molar volume. That's the volume occupied by one mole of any gas at standard temperature and pressure. Um, Avogadro's law, it's more of the same sort of stuff. Um, I'll let you go through this one on your own, uh, see if you can get some sort of answer for that. Uh, the density, let's try this one on uh, together. Calculate the density of four grams of helium at STP.
So you've got to watch that. You can't just say, just because it says STP, that it's one mole. But let's figure this out, okay? So the density, remember, is the mass of the volume. So we've got the mass. So we've got to use that mass. So we're not going back to this moles over here. We just use that moles to figure out the number of liters, right? So we've got that mass. about the uh, combined gas law, we've talked about the individual gas laws, and we've talked about molar volume. Okay, let's take all of that stuff and combine it into one more thing, okay? This is called the ideal gas law. And probably if you remember anything from general chemistry, or a lot of people, what they remember from general chemistry is the ideal gas law. Because it's very easy uh, to get it in your head when you start saying it, I guess. But um, the ideal gas law is this uh, PV equals NR. So if you recall, P is pressure, V is volume. N is number of moles. Uh, T is temperature in Kelvin. Okay, so uh, for the ideal gas law, the temperature has to be in Kelvin. Okay, N of course has to be in moles. Um, the volume uh, it it's got to be in liters, and the pressure has to be in atm. So if they're not in these units, you got to convert them to those units. And that's because this thing here, R, okay, this is a constant. What does that mean? It's kind of like a, a fudge factor, okay? So you got to multiply these numbers by this constant in order to get these things equal to each other, okay? And so R is always going to be the same. And it's written up there. R equals 0. Point, um, 0 0.0821 uh, liter ATM mole. you guys remember that it's this divided by this. Okay. But that's the, what's what we call the ideal gas constant. So the thing is, is if your units aren't in ATM, liter, moles, and Kelvin, if you notice, the ideal gas constant has these units in it. Okay? It won't, your, your um, problem won't come out to the right answer if you can't cancel these things out. So that's why you gotta have them in this unit, okay? Okay, so PV equals NRT. Um, and if you look at, if you analyze PV equals NRT even a little bit more, what you find is all of the gas laws come from that, okay? So PV equals NRT. So if we put initial, 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 well, R is the same. Okay. Divided that by TF, VF, uh, NF, R, TF. Okay. Remember, R's would cancel out like that. 
So it was, yeah, it was [noise] Okay. [noise] Two yards. Two yards. Um, what was the other one? And if you rearrange this thing and call things constant, so if you said number moles in temperature are constant, you would get p i So if k if they were all constant, this would equal one. Right, this side would equal one. Right? And then you would get p i v i equals p F. P F. And that's Boyle's law. Okay? You could do that for everything. Um, if you wanna hold, I dunno, pressure in number of moles constant, you get um ah uh Charles' law. Okay? [noise] If you wanna hold uh temperature and pressure constant, you get Avogadro's law. Okay? So holding two of those constant will give you one of those four laws. Charles' Avogadro's Gay-Lussac or um Boyle's law. Okay? So uh it all comes from this equation here. Okay? This equation and you get that equation from this equation here. Okay? So you can get all of those from the, you could do any gas problem using this equation and this equation here. This is if they change and this is if they stay the same. Okay? So let's talk about them staying the same, which we haven't done yet. We've [noise] just been analyzing, saying okay, if the pressure changes from this to this, what happens to the volume? Okay? Now we're going to look at, well, what if we have the number of moles temperature, pressure, um and the gas constant? Well what would be the be the volume of that thing? Okay, so we're not changing it, we're just looking at the the state it is now. Um, [noise] I wanna look at this. Okay, let's uh let's do this one. Um, what's the volume of gas occupied by five grams of methane blah blah blah? Okay, so um we want, we're gonna wanna use this p v equals n r t. So the first thing we wanna do, or the first thing I always do, is write down p v m p. Here. Instead of equal to something. Okay, so p is number one, what's the pressure? [noise] It's oh one point oh eight atm. One point oh eight atm. How do you know that? Well I just don't wanna put a number down here. [noise] Because it says atm, right? That's pressure. What about v? What's that? Mm. Ah, seven. Oh seven point uh [noise] nine three. Three oh. That's what we're looking for, right? [noise] Seven oh five. Yeah. Three oh. [noise] Oh fuck. Three oh. [noise] So we gotta do the ideal gas law to figure that thing out. Okay? [noise] Which is what this one is. What about n? What is n? Ah, mole. Mole. Never heard that before. [inaudible 1:35:06.58] Oh. Yeah, you gotta convert the grams to moles. So we gotta have a different one, too. So we got m over here. M is five point oh grams. Okay? So let's hold off on that thing right now. So it's grams of methane. [noise] So that should give us a little clue as to what we gotta do. And temperature, what is that? Twenty five Last year it was twenty five. Twenty five Celsius. [inaudible 1:35:45.66] forty. Second year is [inaudible 1:35:44.68] Okay, so we're gonna have to do the same thing again. Okay. So how do we do that? That's a little easier. All right. So twenty five Last year was twenty five. Twenty five plus seventy three. Fifty one. Two ninety eight. Two ninety eight? Okay, so we still need n before we can solve for v, right? So how do we get n from this? [noise] We multiply this by what? [noise] So what do we, what do we want down here? Two grams. Two grams. Grams. We gotta have that because we don't want grams, right? So this has gotta be grams of methane. And what's gotta be up here? Mole. 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 And in fact it's one mole of methane. So what is this conversion factor? One mole of methane equals how many grams, right? How many grams does one mole of methane equal? [noise] Mole. Yeah, sixteen point oh eight, what is it? Something like that. Sixteen point zero four. Zero four. Okay. So how did you get that number? You took um, c which equals twelve point oh eight. Oh. Oh. And you divided it by two point 
notice the next problem here. I'll let you do that on your own. Uh, but it asks for the mass of nitrogen. So you're going to have to convert back from moles back to mass. Okay? But it also gives you the, the well, it gives you the temperature in degrees Celsius. So you've got to convert that to Kelvin. But it gives you the pressure in millimeters of mercury. So you've got to convert that to ATM. Okay? So if you remember, you guys remember how to convert millimeters of mercury to ATM? Yeah, what is it? 1 ATM equals what? 760 millimeters of mercury. And I'll keep that up. What was that? 7 uh, so remember, 1 ATM equals 760 millimeters of mercury. So if we said that we got 700 millimeters of mercury, and we wanted to know the pressure in ATM, okay. remember HG is um, just mercury, like that, like that, right? And we just say 700. Divided by 760, which is uh, 0 0.921. So you'd have to be that quick. The other thing is we could have gone so far, remember, uh, if we would have wanted to ask, well, what's the density of methane gas for the first one? We could have said, well, remember, density equals mass divided by volume. We just learned the volume from doing all that uh, ideal gas stuff, right? And we have the mass given to us, 5 grams, divided by 7.6 liters. Pretty um, uh, dilute, if you will, not very dense, right? Um, a liter is very big, and one gram is not a lot of weight, okay? So if you imagine two, two grams of this is already bigger than a liter, right? It's like 132, 1.32 liters. Um, so that's like, like that or something. Uh, this piece of chalk is probably about two grams. So you can see the difference between the density of solids and the density of, you know, a gas. It's pretty, pretty dramatic, you know. Okay, so let's talk about Dalton's law now. Uh, Dalton's law is a mixture of gases exerts a pressure that's the sum of the pressures that each of the gases would exert if it were present alone under the same conditions, okay? So what does this mean? We got a mixture of gases. The total pressure equals the pressure of one of the gases plus pressure of the other gas plus the pressure of the other gas, okay? So if we look, we want to know, well, what's the pressure of air? Well, if it's at sea level, it's 1 atm. That equals the partial pressure of nitrogen plus the partial pressure of oxygen because those are the two major components. Okay, so that's it for the gaseous phase, okay? So the cool thing about that, uh, that we're moving on to the liquid phase and then from there to the solid phase, is that the gas phase has really been, you know, um, analyzed to death, if you will, especially in general chemistry courses. Liquid phase and solid phase, you don't have to do as much stuff as like with these ideal gas forms, okay? So that's cool. Okay, so let's look at this liquid state. What I'd like you to see here is this is the same volume of liquid, same solution, but in different containers, okay? 
Okay, so you're probably very familiar with this. The liquids um, could take on different shapes depending on the container that they're in. But um, notice again, they're the same volume, so that's kind of revealing, if you will. So the liquid state is characterized by a high density. Remember, relative to gases. Remember, we were talking about, you know. Uh, the methane gas, the density of it is very low, okay? Um, we measure density of gases in grams per liter, right? With volumes or with densities of liquids and solids, well, with liquids we measure them in grams per milliliter, okay? Because they're so much more dense. Uh, solids we measure essentially grams per milliliter, grams per cubic centimeter, right? But anyway, so high density, indefinite shape that depends on the shape of its container, just like what's pictured here. Small compressibility, so it's very difficult to smash them together, okay, because the molecules are already, remember, rolling on top of each other. Okay. And very small thermal expansion. In fact, if you heat liquids up too much, right, they won't expand in the liquid state. What they'll do is go to the gaseous state and expand that. Um, so practically incompressible. So this uh, enables things like uh, brake fluid to work on your car. Of course, if it, the brake fluid was all squeezed out, you know, your car would kind of seize up. Uh, viscosity is a measure of the liquid's resistance to flow. So if you have a very viscous liquid, it doesn't flow very much. If you have a very non-viscous one, it flows quite a bit. It's a function of both the attractive forces between molecules and molecular geometry. Okay, so um, uh, molecules are just like anything else. Um, uh, the shape, it, uh, their properties depend on their shape. So if they're very, very long and stringy and they're going to be trying to roll all over each other, it takes them a long time to do so, okay? Or if they're very sticky, they'll stick together and they can't flow very well. Okay, so this gives them uh, increased viscosity. So if we wanted to compare something like, so first stickiness, right? So if we've got balls are trying to flow this way and uh, they're very sticky to each other, right? They'll stick to each other and they won't flow very well, right? Compare that to one that aren't sticky, right, they'll flow quite easily, okay? So this would be a more viscous, this would be less viscous, okay? So this would be sticky. And this would be not. Right? Let's compare this to a different structure. What if the structure of the molecule looked like this? Right? It would be harder to, for these things to flow on top of each other because, you know, they're just rolling around on top of each other. They would be long and kind of peeling on each other, right? So this also gives more viscosity to um, liquids. So it's a function of the attractive forces and molecular geometry. Um, flow occurs because the molecules can slide easily past each other. Glycerol is an example of a very viscous liquid. It's got these kind of attractive forces that make it sticky to other glycerol molecules. Uh, viscos viscosity decreases with temperature. You've probably seen this on your own. If you um, heat up like some sort of like honey or syrup or something like that, it flows much easier than it does. So like syrup, is, I mean, you can feel how sticky it is when you get it all over you, right? That's one of the reasons. It's also kind of, you know, it's like a sugar molecule that's a couple of sugars stuck together. So it's kind of got a weird geometry and it's got a lot of stickiness. That's why it's viscous, but decreases with increased temperature. Surface tension, I know it's about time to go, but let's just go over this uh, these couple of slides. Surface tension is a measure of the attractive forces exerted at the surface of a liquid. So what happens is molecules like to stick together. Okay, so um, when you're at the surface of a liquid, the attractive forces are very great. Okay, so if you ever see like water bugs walking on um, uh, pools of water, it's because they're taking advantage of this inherent stickiness of the molecules 
at the surface layer um, sticking to each other, and it allows them to put their weight on the water, even though they're heavier and more dense than the water, they should be falling through. Uh, so the net, net attractive forces pull the molecules toward each, to each other, and that's why raindrops are like um, spherical in shape, or you see beads on like your shower curtain, because they want to kind of be next to each other, and the easiest way to do that is to form a sphere. A surfactant is a substance that decreases the surface tension. Um, for example, soap. So any sort of soaps will decrease the surface tension, and you'll see instead of uh, like beading, you'll see streaking when you put soap into it. Okay. Um, you'll not if you have soapy water, those little water bugs they'll fall through um, the surface. They won't be able to stand on it. Um, and we'll we'll talk about vapor pressure next time. Okay.